Welcome to the Kingsway Christian Fellowship Sermon Podcast. We are streaming live from Karam Downs in Melbourne, Australia. Kingsway Christian Fellowship is a non-denominational, Bible-believing, and preaching church. We believe the Bible is the inherent Word of God and preach it verse by verse. You can follow us at www.kingswaycf.com and follow our video sermons. Now, join us as we listen to the latest sermon preached by Pastor John Shipman. We come to church to grow in grace. We come to church to grow in knowledge. We come to church to grow in wisdom. This is what Paul prays. He writes it down there in Ephesians. He says, I pray for you, church, that you grow in wisdom, in the spirit of wisdom, and in the knowledge of Him. Every sermon that I preach needs to be about the knowledge of Christ. And today we're going to see none less than that. We're going to talk today about the healing of the lame man and why miracles. If you talk to people today, everybody wants to see a miracle. Everybody wants to see a sign. Show us a sign. Show us something supernatural that will make us believe what you say is true. And there is such big movements in the world who go with signs to people and they wow the people. Why? Because of these signs. And some of them are not true, but they catch the people anyway. And what is the miracles about? Why do we see so many miracles in the first part of the book of Acts? And then later on as we go through, because remember Acts is a transitional book, we don't see so many miracles they saw. Now believe me, miracles are still true. Who believe in that? I certainly do believe in miracles. But you will see a transition of the miracles changing over time. And we need to answer those questions today. So we go in our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Again, we're in Acts chapter 2 verse 46. I thought, what a better way to start the sermon than to go back to the church. So it says in verse 46. You remember last week we touched on this. He says, so continually, daily, with one accord, in the temple. Everybody say temple. Where is the temple? It's where people gathered together in those days. How many times did they go there? Daily. Can you see that? He says, daily, continually, one accord, in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house. Everybody say house. Can you see it's two different locations here? So I want to suggest to you this morning that this verse is not, and this is not theology for the home church model. Now believe me, I do believe there are certain places where home church models is good. You look in China. It works a treat. It works there because God's using it there. But it's not to say we're going to go back to Acts chapter 2 and say, because now they continued going from house to house, that is how we ought to go together and have church. No, no, no. It says they went to the temple and they also went to the homes. They continued to pray in the temples daily. This was one of their customs. This is one of their traditions. This was their church. So every single day, think of yourself, some people, you can't get them even on a Sunday. They'll come once a month on a Sunday to church. But these people were so devoted that they went every single day to the temple to pray. Not only once, but three times a day. Can you envision your life like that? But it was different times. You see, they went to the temple and they prayed. They continued to do that. And then after they left there, they went breaking bread from house to house. So the fellowship happened, happened where? At the homes. Plus, think for yourself, they could not have communion in the temple. Why couldn't they have communion in the temple? Because they rejected Jesus as the Christ. Communion is exactly what it says. He gave his body and his life, his blood for you and for me as emblems in resemblance of his death. 
And there were certain factions within the temple who wouldn't want to have that. Could you imagine they turn up there with communion bread and everything and having communion in the temple? It would have been an outroar. You see, they didn't go to make a splash or an outroar. They went to serve God. And that's the difference. So see, see, there's clearly a distinction here. So they went to the temple daily. And then for fellowship, they went from house to house. They went, they had a meal from house to house every day. And after the meal, or maybe before the meal, they broke bread every single day. They had the communion table, and they remembered the Lord. But I want to focus you on verse 46. He says, and they ate their food. You see, this is a proof that they had food, not only breaking bread. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, and praising God, and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Think about this. How is your lifestyle today as a child of God? There is certainly things we can learn from the early church. When they came together as a fellowship after they prayed and they had a meal, there was joy in their fellowship. They talked about joyful things. They talked about true things. What happens these days when people come together? Oh, they talk about the politics, and they talk about this is happening in America, and they talk about the price, and everything is deflating, isn't it? I mean, there's no good news in the world right now, is there? Is there? Come on, tell me. There's no good news in the world. But it fascinates the mind of the Christian so much that even Christians, when they come together for a meal, can be, can be so occupied by the world and by the things of the world. These people certainly were steering in an unknown future. We know this. We know this. We, we can sit here in hindsight now and look back and see that they were persecuted. How many times have you heard that you're going to be persecuted for what you believe in? How many times? Once? Many times. Are you being persecuted for being a Christian? Are you? Of course you are. Of course you are. Are you being beaten for that yet? No, not yet. But certain people are beaten for it today. And it is so fascinating. Voice of the Martyrs came and visited our church in New Zealand once. And uh, one of the brothers, I was standing in earshot from this brother, who went over to the person who came from Voice of the Martyrs. And uh, he was saying, tell those people, tell those people in China and wherever they are persecuted that we pray for them. And you know what this person said back to him? He said, yes, I did tell them. And you know what they say? Tell the sleeping church in the West that we are praying for them. You see, we are so occupied. We've got it too easy in the West, brothers and sisters. It's about share prices. It's about home prices. It's about petrol prices. But these people came together. They sold everything. Now, I'm not by far saying you and I should do that because they're still at homes here. But they sold everything. They had no worth in material things. None. And you know what they brought them? Despair? Did it bring them despair? What does the board say? It brought them joy. The word there for gladness is exceedingly joy. The Greek word there means exceedingly joy. And the, and the reason why they translated it into gladness is because exceedingly joy brings gladness in your soul. Notice I didn't say happiness. Yes? We all are looking for happiness. In pursuit for happiness. Happiness disappears like the mist in front of the sun. I give you $5,000 right now, and you go, I'm happy, happy, happy. I've got five grand in my pocket, man. I'm going to burn this money. You go out of here. You've heard me say that before. You hit the speed limit here because you're so happy. Your feet is so hard now and so heavy on that accelerator. You go 40 miles over the kilometers over the speed limit. They pull you over, and they go, there's a thousand bucks for the government. You're not so happy there anymore, are you? 
The share price falls in $3,000 later. You go, now I've only got 1000 over. What happened to your happiness? You see, joy comes from the cross. Joy comes from Jesus. Gladness in your soul comes from only one place. And that is from Him. And nothing on the earth should be able to touch that gladness. These people were so exceedingly glad. And then it says there with simplicity of heart. You see that? Now, they were not simple people. That's not what the word says. Simplicity of heart. What does it mean when it talks about simplicity? I don't think the, translation, the translators used the right word there. I wanted to use the word singleness of heart. Singleness of heart is what the Greek word comes out with. It, they had one thing in single-mindedness. That's what it is. They had only one thing that mattered for them above everything. Guess what that is? Jesus and Him crucified. That's all that mattered for them. And that brought on the gladness. They, they didn't have a lot of things that occupied their minds. You know, we come into church and they say these days, if pe- not in this church though, but if preachers preach, they've only got the audience for 30, 30, 30 minutes, I think. No, no, half a minute. That's how long in some churches you've got the audience. And that's why they bring in smoke machines and they put up lights and they put up and really they want to jump up and down to keep you going to grab your attention. No, no, the reason for that is, is there is people even in churches not with singleness of mind. When you walk through these doors, you've got to have one thing, one thing that you want to do and that is to worship and praise God. That is the singleness of mind. They were so singled in what they believed in. You see, Paul writes about this in Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. He says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to the husband, one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear. You see that? Why would why would Paul fear? He says to them, he writes to them. He says, I gave you singleness of mind, one husband. And you are the, I betrothed you to that. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived by his craftiness, so your what? Your minds may be corrupted. So that your minds may be corrupted. Listen, the devil is so clever these days. All he needs to do with you is to corrupt your mind. And how does he corrupt your mind? He bombard it. He bombard it with messages, with problems, with all of this stuff happening all over the world. Look, we're not ostriches with our heads in the ground. Certainly we look around. We see what's coming. But we walk by faith and trust in God. He says... He can come and corrupt your minds from the simplicity, there's our words, that is in Christ. Simplicity, the single-mindedness. There's another phrase for this, the oneness with Christ. There's another word for it, a good word for it. I'm asking you this morning, as you sit here this morning, what is occupying your mind? What is occupying your mind? Is it Christ? When you see what's going on in the world, can you see it through the cross? Or do you look from it unto the cross? Or don't you even see the cross in what's going on in the world? You see, he says, I fear that somehow, and we are sitting here in 2022, and that somehow came to fruition. We see it playing off. We see, you see, there's even churches who preach a world vision type of message. No, no, we need to preach now more than ever the Word of God. We need to bring more than ever Christ crucified to a lost world. We need to do that. He says, I fear because they're going to corrupt you from the simplicity that is in Christ. Man, I should preach another half an hour and continue just on that. Because it's so serious. It's so serious that they come and they want to deceive. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. And how much is that happening? Tell me, how much is it happening? Can you see it happen? 
Is your eyes wide open to see it when it happens? There is more, many people out there who's talking many words who says, this says God. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, this preacher will not come out here and stand on my own and say, thus says God, if I don't preach the word of God. If you don't hear the word of God coming out of my mouth, I, I, I'm not going to stand in front of God one day and he said, what did you say there? That wasn't from me. But if I stay with the word, you see, he says, who have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit. How many different spirits are operating now in the world? How many? Can you discern them? Did you know, did you know that you need to discern the spirits? Did you know that? Did you know the Bible says that you need to even test my spirit while I'm preaching to you? Test every spirit, the Bible says. Why would he say that? He says it because there are different spirits which you have not received of a different gospel which you have not accepted. You may well put up with it. He says, I fear that you will put up with this different things. You say, why do you come into this way, into this miracle? Because I'm going to talk about miracles. Let's read about the miracle. <clears throat> because the world, the world, everybody, looking for miracles, isn't it? They would ask you, is there miracles happening in your church? They will say, he's the pastor, you know, when he prayed for people, do they get healed? That's the wrong questions. Yes. They should ask, is the cross preached in your church? Is it in spirit and truth from the word of God? In so many churches in my life, and I've seen so many people's hearts broken, taken to churches for healing, and it never happened. And they would all jump up and down. Now, I'm, I'm again, and you're going to hear me in a few minutes say this over and over again. I believe in miracles. Don't come to me and say, you preacher, you don't believe in miracles. But I'll explain it to you. I've seen churches where they, they, had, they had crutches all, all there on one wall. It's just they put them on the wall, all the crutches. And, and, and they go, these are all the people who came here crippled and they walked out here healed and these are all their crutches. What? You want to tell me you have a trophy room? A trophy room of what who did? Have I ever seen Jesus Christ walking around with crutches on a wall or the apostles or anybody having trophies? You see, these are ludicrous things, but people eat it up like custard. Who likes custard? I do. Black forest and custard. Acts chapter 3 verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. You see, here, here goes this man. To the temple, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried. Whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately, everybody say immediately. That's a critical word. Immediately his feet and ankle and bones received strength. So he, leaping, stood up and walked and entered the temple with them. Walking, leaping and praising God. Hallelujah. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. And what happened to him? Beautiful miracle. You've heard it so many times before, have you? This miracle. You've heard sermons about this miracle. And it's truly a miracle. It's written up here. But let me remind you what happened. Because we had a fascinating few weeks here, didn't we? And these, these Christians had a fascinating time. Let me remind you what happened to them. In Acts chapter 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. Is that something, is that a sign? Is that a sign? Yes, it is. 
I mean, if we sit here and all of a sudden my voice, and I'm, I'm trying hard to preach loud so that he comes out, and all of a sudden there comes an, a, a sound that dwarfs my voice, will that be a sign from heaven? These men saw it. They heard it. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. Is that a sign? Yes, it's a sign. You can imagine it happened to these people. And it sat on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that a sign or what? No, no. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. Amen. But it is. It is a sign that the prophecy was fulfilled and began to speak in other tongues. Now, is that a miracle or what? They had in the back of their minds what happened at the Tower of Babel when God came down and he, and he changed all the languages. You remember that day? It was a miracle that day what God did back at the Tower of Babel. And he changed their languages. In fact, he changed their dialects. And they couldn't understand and they scattered out. And here God comes when He pours out His Holy Spirit. You see, they sit in the Tower of Babel, let us, let us, let us. And I hear the same refrain in some churches today. But let me not go there. But here He goes, the Holy Spirit comes down and He uses the same miracle. But this time, He changes the tongues in their mouth so that they could speak to others, so that they could understand and hear. Is that a miracle? Is that a sign? You can imagine these men in a short space of time they saw jesus die they saw the miracle of his resurrection i can continue on they saw so many miracles so many signs and then it says in verse 43 then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles none of them were described were they have you noticed Many wonders. He says many wonders and signs. Luke did not describe any one of these wonders and signs. We're going to go to heaven one day and I would want to sit down and hear about all of these signs and wonders and why the people feared. He says they feared them. So now we have the healing of this man, the lame man. It's the first one that's been described by Luke. He writes this down. Now here's the question then, why miracles? Why did it happen that way? Well, it's a fact, brothers and sisters, if you go to the Old Testament, that miracles validated the apostles as true teachers. You go back to the, the prophets, did they do signs and miracles? Of course they did. The prophets did. Who called fire from heaven? Who said to them, you all pray to your God. Can He hear you? Can He hear you? Maybe you should pray a little bit harder. Maybe you should pray in that direction. It's me, me throwing it in there. Maybe you should do this. Who was that? Elijah. Now when he called on God, what happened? They came fire from heaven. Was that a sign? And then all of a sudden everybody knew this is the man of God. You see... Back in those days, and for the remember what the Jews, the Jews are seeking? Signs. The, the Jews say, show us. And this is now God coming in the first days when the apostles were there. And he uses miracles through the apostles to show the people that these men, these fishermen, these tax collectors, these disregarded from you because they can't speak. Well, these men which you wouldn't sit and listen to. That I have chosen them. And he, he sanctifies it. He validates it. With what? With miracles. With signs. So that they can see. You see there were a lot of teachers in those days. Who would go and listen to the fishermen? Who would go and listen to them? If they haven't done any signs. They would say no no you, you're not legit. You can't do this. So this was proven right through the history. But listen, you say, but give us scripture, preacher. I will. John chapter 3 verse 1. You remember one of those men by the name of Nicodemus? Now I always say, verse 1 is not where this should start. It should start in the previous verses. Quickly, can somebody open up in John chapter 2 and read me the last three verses, the last three or four verses? John chapter 2. Okay. 
Okay, so it says that when he was in Jerusalem, what did he do? Many signs, which he did. He did a lot of signs. And, and how, be, how many believed? Many believed. So he was doing signs there. He was doing miracles and a lot of people came around. But what does the Bible say? Did he commit himself to them? He did not commit himself to the sign seekers. I preached a sermon on this. It's somewhere on the net. Maybe I'll preach it again. He did not commit himself to them. This is Jesus. They came to him. You would say, wait a minute. Revival. Look at all the people. No, no. I don't look at people as Jesus don't look. He looked at the heart. He did not commit himself to them. Why? Because they were seeking what? Signs. I believe that's where the chapter should have started. Because now we find Nicodemus coming to him. Why did Nicodemus come to him by night? I've heard some people say he was afraid to come by day. That's not true. He came by night because Jesus was busy doing signs and crowded during the day. But at night, he went himself to Jesus. And when he came to Jesus, Jesus committed himself to Nicodemus. There's a sermon in itself. But look at this. This man came, a ruler of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Why? Why do we know this? Let's read on. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Apostles. Why did God allow them to do miracles? So that the people can look at them and go, For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you. Can you see? So many signs happened in the book of Acts. At the latter stage, they're even going to lay down the sick on the road so that even the shadow of these men can go over them. You remember when Paul was praying over handkerchiefs? You remember that? It's in the book of Acts. We're going to get there. Send them out and they lay it on people and they got healed. Now I find some churches, they have special made handkerchiefs. And we put them all down here and we pray over them, we anoint them and then we send them out. Is that what God intended for it to be? No. I'm saying it out, you know, I'm, 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 it's no. No, no. But do you still believe in miracles, preacher? Yes, I do. I do believe in miracles. Miracles do happen. There's miracles that happened in this church. But I'm going to bring you back to one word. It'll be interesting. So, why is it not so prominent right now then? Well, we've got the New Testament, don't we? And what happened? The Holy Spirit was poured out. And now, are we under the law or are we under faith? We are under faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, he says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by what? We walk by you want a definition for faith? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. For faith is a substance of things not seen. Yeah? Faith is a substance. You know, that verse always gets me because a substance is this. This is a substance. I throw it to you and you're going to catch it. Why? It's a substance. Faith is a substance of things not seen. That, that gets you. You need to go and sit with that verse and just meditate and spend the whole day on that verse. Faith is a substance of things not seen. But here we go. He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. John chapter 4 verse 48. Then Jesus said to him, this is when that man came to Jesus and he says, heal my son. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means what? Believe. What is belief? Faith. He says, you want to see stuff before you believe. This is what happened in the book of Acts. Yeah, this is what happened with the Jews. They need to see signs. But praise the Lord, I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through His grace, by faith, I am saved. Not of yourself, not of myself, of Him. Hallelujah. It's so wonderful. It's, so, it's, so, it's in your hands. Mark chapter 13, 22. For false Christ. Who? False Christ. Okay, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to do what? To deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take it, see, I have taught you all things beforehand. This is why you are sitting here today and hear it. 
because I'm preaching this message and you hear it today. Don't believe everything you see these days. Believe the Word of God. Come back to the Word of God. So, so this is why it's not prominent. Matthew chapter 12 verse 30. You see, we can go on. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered and saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Why did they want to see a sign from Jesus? Because they want to see if he's from God. Remember what Nicodemus said. He says, because we see these signs, we know you are from God. These men came and they played the same, the, the violin. You, we want to see this. They all said the same thing. They want to catch him out. They want to have, have a gotcha moment. They come to him, they say to the Pharisees, saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But, where's my brother's not here today? Sharp contrast. He answered them and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after signs, and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What is the sign of the prophet Jonah? Sorry? Yes, three days in the belly of the whale. What is that a type of? Jesus Christ on the cross. Dead for three days. He said, you want a sign? The sign will come, but you won't believe it. The sign is the cross. He says, I am that sign. You want to see a real sign that I'm going to be from God? I'm going to be dead, resurrected, go up to heaven, and you're still going to walk around looking for a sign. But the sign has already happened. The sign has already happened. The miracle has taken place. But I'll tell you what you now people say to me, but you don't believe in miracles. Yes, I do. I do believe in miracles today. You see, what happened when they walked around and they grabbed this man and they pulled him up? What was the word that you all said? Immediately. Yes? That is a miracle. So what is a miracle? Miracle is when you take time out of the equation. That is a true miracle. So if they have given this man the best medicine under the sun, and say, hey son, hey sir, well he's not a son, he was old by then, 40 years old, hey, we're going to give you these pills, and two months from now you may be healed. Is that a miracle? Not then. The miracle was everybody had to see, there he's lame, he couldn't walk, bam, immediately he can walk. That's a miracle. That's what happened in those days. What's the miracles happening in our days? You see, I believe there's some medicine which is a miracle from God. I believe that. You know, when polio came around, there was medicine that saved people. And, and you know, I, I know there's some people who say all medicine is from the devil and, and we've got the cross and the snake around it. Yes, I get that. I've studied it all. I know all of that. Come and ask your questions. I've got it all. I studied it. But let me just tell you one thing. Appendix. Appendix is a really interesting thing, isn't it? There's a small little thing in your stomach area somewhere. Did you know that there are so many people who died from a, appendix? And what happened? The Lord, through His way and wisdom, made it that there could be doctors today. If you get the appendix, what do they do? They cut you open, take it out, you live. You live. That's a miracle. My brother, what happened to you is a miracle. But what did they give you, my brother? They gave you medicine. They helped you. The fact that you're sitting here and the medicine worked on you, combined with the prayers that we pray as a church, is what you brought you here. Amen. I believe in, I can tell you these miracles. I can tell you miracles that happened in my life. You know, I was a young man, I had such a pain on my stomach when I walked into, in, into the church that night. I, I don't know, you know, it was a pain, intense pain. And at the prayer meeting, I said, Lord, you can heal me. And I walked to the front, and I, nobody touched me. I just prayed, I said, Lord, I want to leave it here. I walked to the back, when I went to the back, that pain was gone. I can tell you these things. So look, miracles work, but... You know, I don't need the miracles to believe in God or to make myself an apostle or a prophet. I don't need that. You don't need miracles to believe in God. Let me tell you about a miracle that I did see. I never saw. I never saw uh, what some people say that they saw miracles. People's legs grow just like that. You've heard those miracles. I've never saw of those. But I can tell you of this miracle which I saw. I saw. Dead people being resurrected with my own eyes. I saw it. Not one. I've literally seen people to come to life. They were dead. 
Truly, they were dead. I was there. I'm witness. And when we prayed, they became alive. Follow me to this verse. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. The biggest miracle that I want to tell you about. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. No, no, I didn't see people physically being raised from the dead. But I've seen people who was like this. They were dead. And let me tell you, if you sit here today and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I'm sorry to say, but I'm going to say it. You are dead. You're a corpse walking. Oh, you've got, you've got nice eyes and you've got breath and you've, you've got everything. But if you haven't come to the cross and are born again, make sure. Otherwise, you're just a corpse. I've seen this happen. He says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. I've seen people when we pray and the Lord save their souls. They're spiritually no more dead. They're alive. They've got eternal life and they change their backs on the course of the world. I've seen them changing their back on the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? That's Lucifer. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. You, you know I've said there's two kinds of people in the world. Sons of God and sons of disobedience. There's no gray areas here. And then he says, amongst also we conducted ourselves in the last of your flesh. In this, you see there, this is one sentence. All the way through. One. Full stop. You need to go sit this afternoon. You need to go and open up your Bible. Take a deep breath. And read the whole thing until you come to the full stop. And then you see how many times he uses the word dead in that sentence. He says, you were dead. Here he says, even when we were dead in your sins, he made us alive. He says, twice he made us alive. And then he says this, listen, listen, this gets better. He says, he made us alive. Then he raised us up. Is that a miracle? You are a miracle if you're a son of God. And then what else? He made us to sit together in heavenly places. You see, here we come to this miracle. Now Peter and John went together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Like I said, this is what they did continually. And, and you know, somebody said, we need to do what the church did in the book of Acts. Well, we can't. It's physically impossible to do this. They went three times a day to the, to the temple to pray. Can you do that today? Can you? Can you come here? If I ask them to give us this hall and we're going to have church every week, 7-7, seven, 24-7, seven, seven, and you come every single day, three times a day you come to here, is that going to be possible for you? Why? Come on, you're a, you're a Christian. Job? What else? Family? What else? He said, well, wait a minute. This is what I've heard, but they've done it there. We should go back to the church in Acts. How many times have you heard that? It is impossible to go back to the church in Acts. Let me just remind you why. Because the church in Acts started off with what? With Jews first. Remember in the transition, we are still with Jews. There's not a lot of Gentiles in yet. That comes later. What was the tradition of the Jews? The Jews fashioned from the Old Testament, from yonky years back. They fashioned their lives around the temple. They were the chosen nation. They fashioned their businesses around the temple. They would close their businesses and go and pray and come back and do business. Go and pray and come back and do business. Go and pray and come back to business. That's what they would do. You see, you see, it was easy for them to do that. It's not for us today. We can't do that in our day and age. We can't, it is not in our, they stuck with custom. You see in Psalm 55, it started as for me, I will call upon the God and our Lord shall save me. Evening, morning and noon I will pray and cry out. You see, it started off three times a day. The first one is in the morning, it's Saharit. They would come to bed there and pray. Then they would come at noon in Mincha. They would pray. And then in Arfat in the afternoon, they would come together and pray. And these men, because they were Jewish boys, were accustomed to that. They kept on going back to the temple. 
back to the customs, back to the tradition. We will see later on in the book of Acts that disappears. You see why I say we can't write our doctrine for the church in the first part of the book of Acts? You can't. It was a daily occurrence. In Numbers 28 it was given to us. I'm going to save time here but you can go and read. In Numbers 28 we see that God said to them at the, their appointed time they needed to come together day by day as a regular burnt offering. So they had offering in the morning and in the evening. They had morning offerings every single day. They would bring a small little lamb and they would offer it. And the sweet aroma would fill the temple. And then in the afternoon, 3 o'clock, and it's at this time that John and Peter came around and they saw this man. Now let me quickly catch up on this miracle. He was a certain man. He was lame from his mother's womb. He was carried there. He laid at the gate at, of the temple. Uh, the temple of beautiful. It was a beautiful, I can tell you all about this gate. It was a beautiful gate. It was gold on the gate. It was... It was um, the separation between the men and the women. You, you get the women, women's court, you get the court of the Gentiles, and there was a gate there which was sitting on the side entering to the women. You've experienced it when you went to the synagogue. But that was part of their customs. And it's at this gate that this man went and he was sitting there. It was, it was good for him, to sit, for him to sit there. Because it was in their customs as well that the beggars would sit there and they would be given food. But not only that, you know, these men would come in, they would bring money for the temple, and they would bring arms for the beggars. Because they believed the more they do it for the beggars, the better it is for them in the afterlife. It's, it, you know, they, they get credits for this. And fixing his eyes on him, Peter and John said, look at us. So he gave them his attention. He was expecting something. I always think about this, and I think Peter and John walked past that man most probably a lot of times. He was there from birth. How many times would they have? There's not only one beggar who was there. was a lot of beggars. This is why he said they fixed their eyes on him. So they looked through all these beggars. Why that man? Why that particular man? There were so many others. They looked at the one man. He saw their gaze and he think, Oh, today I'm going to get some money from these guys. And then they walked over to him. So he's expectant. All of these things is... Is good for a miracle. And then he walks over to me and says, Silver and gold I have not. Jeez, that would go down bad in the prosperity gospels these days, wouldn't it? Silver and gold I have not. I haven't got money, man. Can you imagine that poor beggar? Oh. I thought there was something coming here. Come on, man. The disappointment. But what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and immediately his feet and his bones were strengthened. I want you to think in the next part what's happening here. This man did not learn to walk ever in his life. Never. It says he was there from what? From the womb. He couldn't walk. But all of a sudden... When he pulled him up, this man leaped up, strength back into the... You, you know what needs to happen when you walk? Brother, you went through this. Why did they give you that thing to hold on to? It's for balance, isn't it? It's for balance. Why, what do you see little babies do? They stand up and they go, boom. They fall over. How many times do they do that? A lot of times. And then, eventually one day they stand up and you go, wow, they stand up. It, it builds the, the brain, says to these legs... Push, toe, pull, push, and then first, 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 and then you go. This man, when he pulled him up, balance everything. See, that's what a miracle do. God is perfect. He's perfect. I, I, I just think of another man. Can you think in the Bible of another man this happened to? Yes, I can. Adam. You remember Adam? God created Adam. Did he create him as a baby or as a full-grown man? A full-grown man. He blows, he blows into his nose the breath of life. And he's, he starts getting veins and blood. And boom, up he goes and he walks. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't it? He's wonderful. 
I, I'm going to stop here because I think we can continue on a, a lot about this. But I want you to think about this. The words that's used in Hebrew there is the word asha. Asha for Adam. When God made him, he ushered him. That means to make something recognizable out of a formless mass. He took some clay, put it all together, and it was formless. He formed it, and then he put life into him. You know what happened to this man? It's the same thing. That was such a mess, his legs. And when he grabbed him, Asha happened, and he made him into this man. Now, there's a few observations, and then we will pray. God brings this miracle together. It's so clear. There's this lame man. He was carried there. He's sitting in amongst all of the others. Every single day of his life, 40 years they've been going there. 40 years. He sits there, he gets money, he goes. Somebody come and had to carry him away. Some pass him by. Some, some days is good, some days is bad. And here he comes. He had to be there to be proof. He had to be the 40-year-old man that had to be proof of this. Then the apostles is going in the ninth hour. Why that hour did they focus on this man? They had to be there to perform the miracle. Why? So that people believe they are from God. And then there were the people, the crowds, they came together. You see, this is what God put together. We can't copycat that. So next Sunday we're going to have a revival meeting and I put signs up there and bring all the sick. You know, we're going to have a healing service. I'm not mocking anybody. Please get me right here. But we cannot put God on a stage and say perform. He puts everything together for a miracle and then He performs the miracle. The miracle is unexpected. There were many other beggars there, like I said. They probably walked past Him before. He was a regular. He came every single day. But it's in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, when they came to him, they didn't do any, anything else. They say, in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And he pulled him up. They connected him to Jesus. Let it be known, any ministry under the sun, if you do not connect people to Jesus, you are but a liar and a hypocrite. And this ministry as well. If I don't preach Jesus, I don't want you to come here and follow me. Follow Kingsway. What is Kingsway, by the way? Let me tell you. In, in, the, in, in the annals of time, Kingsway, the name Kingsway will disappear. It's not an important name. This church is not important. I'm not important. But what is important is that you are connected to Christ. If I preach anything different, I will stand before Him one day. And He will say, not well done. But this is it. They connect Him to Jesus. And then... The miracle is instantaneous. The man leaped from birth he didn't know. And we remember this from Abraham. Let me just show you one verse which will show you how good God is. He fulfilled scripture and followed it up by scripture. Because next week or the week after we're going to see the sermon. Isaiah 35.4 Say to those who are fearful, Fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with a recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall open. The eyes of the deaf shall hear, shall be stopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer. And the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. How wonderful is it? Did it happen? It happened when Jesus came and it happened when these men were there. So do you believe in miracles? Yes, I do. Do we understand now why these kind of miracles happened? Yes, we do. Let's pray.